Let's take a few minutes to talk about uh, turf grass species selection, uh, just species selection in general, the importance of it. Then we'll talk uh, briefly about the cool season grasses you might use in lawns and parks and golf courses. And then there'll be a separate recording where we talk about the warm season grasses. Uh, so first, just uh, uh, regarding species selection in general, it's a very important part of um, uh, many, any, maintaining any turf grass site. You know, uh, mowing, fertilization, irrigation uh, come to mind uh, for most as, as being very important management factors. But uh, even before that, uh, choosing the right grass for the location uh, is uh, going to make management easier. It's going to uh, reduce as much as possible the, uh, the variety and severity of pest problems you might have. Um, you know, traffic tolerance, those type of things. So choosing the right grass uh, when you have that opportunity to either uh, plant a new turf area or to uh, convert an existing one to another grass, uh, it's it's an important step and there should be pretty careful consideration given to what what kind of grass you're going to, to plant in that, uh, in that new lawn situation. Uh, very important to remember that there is no perfect turf grass for all sites. Uh, doesn't matter if you're talking just the front range of Colorado or the United States in general, uh, no grass is perfect. Uh, there will always be a better choice and there will always be uh, probably quite a few uh, less uh, than optimal choices for any kind of site. So uh, take this task uh, uh, seriously, do your homework, uh, when you have the opportunity to uh, uh, plant a new lawn or to convert uh, an old lawn into a new one, because it will ultimately influence um, management, maintenance, the cost of maintenance, um, uh, you know, the how that lawn is used, how well it uh, does, um, you know, with the shade or the sun or wherever you're planting it. Uh, so something I want to avoid is something like this. So this may be targeted towards the uh, landscape design students or landscape architecture students a little bit, but um, you know if you look at uh, this uh, drawing, um, every plant in that landscape is labeled uh, not only to species but also to varieties. But when you look at uh, uh, what's happening over here with the lawn, it just says lawn. Like it doesn't matter if it's bluegrass or buffalo grass or tall fescue or any of the other many grasses you could plant in this situation. Uh, j just another example of this, um, uh, I guess to hit home here, again, everything is labeled. Um, there's a nice plant list here with, again, species and varieties and how many you need. But then here in the lawn, it just says lawn. Um, so that doesn't give very good direction to, in this case, the homeowner, uh, the, the whoever's going to be installing, building this landscape. Um, this, you know, there at least should be something in there, some kind of a name, so that when they go to build this uh, landscape, they know what to tell the sod grower or tell the contractor what kind of uh, grass are we going to plant in this lawn, and then hopefully there's some thought that goes into what that species is going to be in the lawn. So how do you, how do you determine what's the best grass to use in a in a lawn or a park or a golf course fairway or whatever the case might be? Uh, you know the same principles apply. Um, you know really how much is that turf going to be used? What's the uh, the traffic intensity? Is it going to be merely uh, for looks and aesthetics, or is it going to get a lot of kid traffic or dog traffic or golf cart traffic or soccer games, whatever the case might be? Uh, you know, some other important things are how willing is the person managing uh, that 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 turf area going to be to provide the adequate care, and um, that could be water, could be time, could be fertilizer, uh, whether or not they're going to use pesticides. Um, some other important characteristics of the the site might be: is it sunny? Is it shady? Uh, what's the irrigation water like? Is the soil salty? Is the water salty? Um, what, what's the elevation? Very important question in a place like Colorado. What does 
uh, well in Vail or Aspen may not do so well out on the eastern plains of Colorado. So, and vice versa. Um, so, lots of questions you could ask. Um, you know, a, kind of an important one sometimes is availability of the the grass that you might want to put in that in that turf situation. If you want a seed, is there seed available? If you want a sod, is there a sod grower close by? Uh, that can uh, uh, supply that sod. So a lot of questions, a lot of thoughts should go into um, uh, the selection of the species uh, for any new or renovated turf site. Uh, so we're going to be talking uh, today mainly about the, the cool season grass species uh, and what gra grows best in what we call the cool season zone, which is the, the northern part of uh, the United States. But really, you could extend this uh, throughout uh, really anywhere in the world. There are going to be warm season zones where only warm season grasses do well and colder places where the uh, cool season uh, species do well. But then you do get kind of a mix uh, uh uh, area uh, that we often call the transition zone in between those those warm and cool zones where you might uh, be able to plant warm or cool season species. But oftentimes your list of uh, grasses for that transition zone is is uh, a little bit shorter. So cool season zone, we're talking bluegrasses and fescues and bent grass and rye grass and those type of uh, cool season grasses. Uh, buffalo grass, even though it's a warm season grass, can do quite well throughout much of the cool season zone. So we'll talk about buffalo grass in a little more detail in the next uh, presentation. Uh, the transition zone is a place where it's it can be really warm in the summer, really cold in the winter. So your warm season grasses may winter kill uh, during a, a tough winter and a tough summer. Uh, the cool season grasses may not do so well. So it can be a very difficult place to be a turf manager, to grow healthy turf. Uh, so even more important to choose uh, the species wisely and even uh, within species, uh, which varieties are you going to plant that are more heat or cold tolerant for those species. And then there's the warm season grass zone. Uh, that'll be uh, the focus of the next presentation, but this is where you use grasses like Bermuda grass and St. Augustine grass. So think maybe more tropical, uh, longer summers, uh, hotter daytime temperatures, uh, very warm nighttime temperatures, uh, humidity, those type of things. Uh, take special grasses to do well under those conditions. So uh, almost invariably, if you try planting cool season grasses down in those in that warm season zone, they're not going to do well. And uh, likewise, many of the warm season grasses, unless they've been uh, bred to be very cold hardy, aren't going to do well in the cool season zone or maybe even the transition zone. So species selection is important no matter where you go. Um, and it gets even further subdivided in the southern zone where um, you have the very, very tropical part of the southern zone, places like Florida and, and New Orleans and, uh, you know, a very southern part of uh, uh, Texas on the Gulf Coast where it's very, very tropical. Uh, those require different species. And then the, the more cooler parts of the southern part of the United States where you might have, you know, the mountains of of, of Tennessee and Carolinas, uh, you can have uh, very good luck growing some of the cool season species. And you go down a few, uh, you know, a thousand feet in elevation, and then all of a sudden you're using warm season species just a few miles away. So, so you can have a lot of variability, um, especially in the southern zone. What well, we're going to focus on the cool season grasses right now. Um, the Kentucky bluegrass is the most commonly used um, grass in this cool, cool season zone, the most often used, most often planted cool season turf grass. It sets the standard for quality, very dense and dark color and good density and a very uniform, very attractive grass. Um, it's got, uh, uh, it grows by rhizomes, so this makes it an, e uh, an easier grass for sod growers to produce. And this is why it's the most planted and most grown sod uh, species in the northern part of the United States. It's relatively inexpensive and fairly easy to grow as a sod 
And so that makes it a less expensive alternative for sodding lawns as maybe uh, compared to buffalo grass or a Bermuda grass or the more what, what I might call specialty grasses. Um, it is very drought resistant, but it'll turn brown when it goes dormant. Lots of varieties out there. Uh, downsides of this grass, uh, not very shade tolerant. It's probably the least salt tolerant of all the grasses. So if you have salty well water, salty soil, uh, this is not a, a grass to be planted in those sites. Uh, can get quite a few uh, uh, insect pests, uh, Japanese beetle, the grubs like this, bluegrass billbug. Um, so it's not without its problems. And uh, uh, the more stressful the conditions it's growing under, the more difficult it is to grow this grass. So very hot south and west exposures here in a place like Colorado, uh, a tough place to uh, grow Kentucky bluegrass compared to maybe the uh, a more lightly shaded lawn. But if it gets too shady, then it doesn't do well in heavy shade as well. So uh, you have to cite uh, bluegrass uh, correctly, but overall, it's probably the most planted and, and for many good reasons, the most planted uh, grass in the home lawns, especially in Colorado. Uh, a variation on the Kentucky bluegrass theme is something that's called hybrid bluegrass. There are a number of sod growers sell this hybrid, or sometimes they call it Texas hybrid. Um, this is a cross between Kentucky bluegrass and Texas bluegrass. The Texas bluegrass being a native bluegrass grows in the, uh, Texas, the panhandle of Texas, very heat and drought tolerant but not a very attractive grass on its own. So uh, turf grass breeders have been able to uh, cross Kentucky bluegrass with Texas to get a hybrid that has some of the good characteristics of uh, Texas bluegrass with the uh, attractiveness of the uh, Kentucky bluegrass. Another species that's very commonly planted and often, especially when there are seed mixes planted, um, perennial ryegrass. So this can be, uh, oftentimes you'll find this in uh, 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 grass seed mixes sold for home lawns uh, because it looks like Kentucky bluegrass as far as uh, texture and color and growth rate. So it mixes well with Kentucky bluegrass, but it can be used as a monoculture. So here's uh, Augusta National Golf Course and the fairways and, and rough areas on that course, at least when it's played for most of the year, are 100% uh, perennial ryegrass. So it makes a very beautiful playing surface. Uh, many athletic fields have perennial ryegrass uh, as their playing surface. So it's a very versatile grass, uh, not a native to North America, uh, but a very beautiful grass and is very well adapted here to the cool season parts of, uh, of uh, North America. Uh, it's a very aggressive seedling. Uh, the seed germinates quickly. The seedling grows quickly. Um, that's good for uh, competition against weeds. Not so good if you're planting it in combination with bluegrass, which is a very slow germinating grass. So it will outcompete and uh, uh, really smother, if you will, uh, uh, Kentucky bluegrass when it's seeded in a mix with bluegrass. So um, this, this picture is an interesting one. This shows where repeated seeding of perennial ryegrass into a, a soccer field in New York where um, they did not want to use uh, weed control products. They, they had kind of had a pesticide ban on these fields. Uh, so the fields were getting overtaken by crabgrass. But uh, what they found was um, a colleague at Cornell University, Frank Rossi, that by uh, frequent um, seeding of perennial ryegrass, you could outcompete much of the um, uh, the uh, uh, crabgrass and uh, that ryegrass uh, uh, can be a pretty predominant part of the, of a field, but that's expensive in terms of both seed and the labor to do it, but it is an alternative for people who wanna do uh, maybe uh, organic, if you will, uh, lawn care. Uh, it does get deep roots, which gives us some pretty good short-term drought resistance. Long-term, if you turn the water off on this stuff, it doesn't have a good dormancy mechanism. so. It'll, uh, it'll die with long-term drought. So it's uh, uh, an interesting option. Um, as, a, as a pure home lawn, it's going to be kind of a higher maintenance home lawn, but it can make a very beautiful home lawn. Uh, here's some pictures showing its versatility and use for a, a sports turf. 
and this shows the Denver Broncos uh, uh, playing field. And uh, this uh, picture on the left was in July, about 10 years ago. Shows uh, a concert or, or what happened after a concert was held. And that's where the stage was and the, and the, the field seating and everything. And so the grass died uh, because of the length of the concert. And here's the picture, not even a full month later um, of that field uh, that basically was restored using um, uh, aggressive overseeding with uh, exclusively perennial ryegrass. So, uh, so the ryegrass can be a great fend to the sports turf manager, uh, but even for a homeowner who's got that backyard where there's lots of kids and dogs playing. Um, so frequently seeding that lawn with ryegrass can keep uh, bare spots from developing. Um, a neat thing about ryegrass, perennial ryegrass, is that it's uh, endophytic, meaning it can have a fungus that grows in the plant, doesn't harm the plant, it's not like a disease, uh, but this fungus confers um, uh, resistance to insect feeding. So insects like uh, uh, adult billbugs, which might feed on the leaves, uh, uh, cutworms and sod webworms and uh, things that feed on the leaves of the grass will be discouraged by the endophyte. Now, the endophyte does not grow in the roots, only in the shoots. So, so underground insects like grubs and uh, billbug larvae, uh, they won't be affected by the endophyte growing in the top of the plant, but uh, the foliar feeding insects will be uh, deterred and kind of repelled by the uh, endophyte growing in uh, the ryegrass. Uh, we should add here that tall fescues and fine fescues, which I'll be talking about next, uh, may also be endophytic. Uh, that will be stated on the label or on the bag of the seed that you buy, whether there's endophyte um, in the seed or not. Downsides of uh, perennial ryegrass is it is a fairly high maintenance grass. It likes fertilizer, it likes water, it likes to be mowed. Um, doesn't have very good long-term drought um, uh, uh, resistance or dormancy. Uh, the leaves can shred. Um, uh, when uh, uh, the mower blades are dull or the mower is not well adjusted. Um, it can outcompete other grasses, which could be considered a plus if those grasses are weeds. But uh, a lot of times when it's frequently overseed, it becomes a mono stand um, where it's been used. And uh, it also does get uh, its share of uh, pretty severe turf diseases um, in Colorado. It's pretty disease free, but you just get a little bit east, even to like central Nebraska and central Kansas, where it gets more humid and you see um, some pretty severe disease problems on perennial ryegrass. So um, that part of the country probably wouldn't be a recommended grass for a home lawn uh, and even for golf courses. It can be a pretty high maintenance uh, uh, golf course grass where it's hot and humid. Tall fescue is another excellent cool season option uh, to uh, bluegrass uh, or perennial ryegrass. It can have very nice color and density and that type of thing as the, as the picture on the, on the bottom shows. Uh, it is mainly a bunch grass though, although some of the newer varieties uh, have some weak rhizomes. Uh, but when it's a bunch grass growing in a bluegrass lawn, it looks weedy. When it's growing in 100% tall fescue lawn, it can look very nice. So this is an example of a plant that could be a weed or a desirable turf grass and uh, depends on where it's growing. It has relatively low nitrogen requirements. It gets really deep roots, so it can give you the impression it has low water use rate. Actually, it has a pretty high water use rate, but it gets very deep roots and it takes advantage of the water deeper in soils because of that fact. Um, and while it has good heat tolerance, it is pretty... Uh, poor long-term drought resistance, so it doesn't go dormant very well. So when it turns brown due to lack of water, um, it's often dead, unlike the bluegrass that's turned brown in this uh, uh, upper photo. Uh, that bluegrass is just dormant. It'll come back when uh, the water resumes. So uh, no grass is perfect. This is a, a great example of that, but uh, tall fescue can be a great alternative to uh, Bluegrass. One, one, uh, a, a couple of advantages over bluegrass that tall fescue has is it does not get in a crowded green spot and it uh, doesn't get very much thatch. So, uh, bluegrass can be a thatchy grass, tall fescue isn't. 
um, gets few insect pests. And again, it may be endophytic, so it can repel insects that way. So uh, very versatile grass. Um, um, sometimes it grows a little fast and needs more frequent mowing. Uh, you have to keep your mower blades pretty well adjusted to uh, keep it from shredding, but uh, it can provide a very, very nice lawn. Again, as I stated, it gets its drought resistance from deep roots now due to a dormancy mechanism. So when it runs out of that deep water, that water that's two or three feet deep, and it can make roots that deep, um, it will turn brown, but it won't be dormant brown. It'll be dead brown. So an important thing to remember that long-term uh, dormancy is not uh, present very well in tall fescue. Okay, fine fescues. Uh, these are uh, grasses that have a wide range of tolerances, so they can tolerate some of the worst soils, um, uh, salty soil, compacted soil, gravelly or rocky soil, high pH soil, low pH soil, uh, very shade tolerant. Um, you know, so it sounds kind of like a wonder grass, uh, but it's probably its main downside is it's a very slow growing grass, so it won't take, um, you know, uh, a concentrated traffic very well or long-term traffic. So you can never put fine fescue in a, a soccer field or you don't want this in a backyard where you got lots of kids and dogs. But in a front yard that might be shady where you don't have much traffic, this can be a beautiful grass. So just an example of a, a grass where you really have to make sure it's, it's a fit for that site and for that use before you recommend it. Uh, Pine fescue is kind of an umbrella term. Uh, there are a number of uh, species. Most people agree that there are about five species of what we call the fine fescues. Um, and some of them are, are have different colors like the sheep fescues, which are kind of a glaucous blue-green color. Uh, these are akin to those little ornamental fescues that you see planted in, in uh, uh, rock gardens and in uh, many ornamental beds these days. Uh, probably the more commonly planted ones are the chewings and the, uh, the creeping fescues and the hard fescues for lawns. So uh, uh, they prefer dry soil, don't get a lot of insect problems, um, very dense grass, very attractive grass. It does tend to lay over a little bit, though. It doesn't stand up real straight like bluegrass does. Um, and that kind of bothers some people. But um, uh, I think kind of an underused grass. Uh, in situations where it might be uh, uh, very well adapted. It's kind of a neat grass in that you can uh, kind of naturalize with it. So here's a, one of those hell strips along the street, hard place to grow anything. And they've just planted this, in, in this case, sheep fescue uh, and not mowed it. And this looks very nice, very natural. Uh, at this mowing height, it'll tolerate a good amount of traffic, but it's still nice here. They have a little path from the street through this because, uh, again, concentrated traffic will wear, wear this grass out. Uh, kind of a nice grass used for no mow areas. Here's some pictures of no mow fine fescue lawns. Um, you know, eventually this can kind of become a management problem because uh, a lot of biomass accumulates and you have to go in occasionally and kind of harvest this stuff and rejuvenate it. Um, Otherwise, the, the fescue kind of self thins and it kind of smothers itself if you uh, overwater it, especially. But uh, makes kind of a neat appearance when you don't uh, when you don't mow it. Here's another grass, kind of a specialty grass called alkali grass. Uh, this is a grass where you would use in those very salty uh, situations, salty irrigation water or. Uh, places where you have very poor drainage and salts from fertilizers or from irrigation water accumulate. Uh, and you can get to the point where no grass will survive except maybe alkali grass. So it can tolerate for short periods of time, almost uh, ocean water sal salinity levels. So very, very salt tolerant. It can make a very nice uh, uh, turf. Um, it looks very much like fine fescue. Uh, most people have trouble telling the two apart. Um, Interesting thing about the alkali grass, though, is that once the saltiness of the soil or the water disappears, other plants will come in and kind of outcompete it and 
So weeds will come in or other turf grasses can come in. In this lower picture, these lines, this, this uh, kind of grayish color grass, this is the alkali grass on a golf course fairway. And these lines are where drainage was put in. And what's happened here is perennial ryegrass has taken over and outcompeted the, the alkali grass where the drainage is good because the salt levels have decreased uh, enough to allow healthy ryegrass to grow there. So just an example of uh, how if the salt goes away, a lot of times the alkali grass goes away as well. But it can be a very useful grass for those uh, very salty places. You'll see this used along roadsides um, or in parks that have just poor drainage and very salty soil, or in those unfortunate situations where the only water you have to irrigate with is very salty. Uh, uh, bent grasses are cool season grasses. Uh, we'd never recommend these for a home lawn, but for golf course fairways and greens and tees, um, they can be a great choice. Uh, you wouldn't want to use these in, even in a rough on a golf course. So um, these are for closely mown areas. The grass really only does well if it's closely mown. Um, it could be a, a, a pretty stress tolerant plant. It, it actually, the bent grass is a kind of remarkable drought resistance um, and uh, uh, they're shade tolerant. They tolerate low mowing. They're very, very, very cold tolerant. Um, you know, 30 below, 40 below zero won't, won't kill bent grass. So, um, so lots of neat things, adaptations about this grass, but it is not a grass you would ever want to plant in a home lawn. It is very, very thatchy. It scalps when you mow it. Um, just not a good grass for a homeowner to be taken care of. It uh, can get quite a few t uh, diseases, even here in a place like Colorado, where we don't generally see many disease problems on home lawns. But um, wherever bent grass is used, you get dollar spot and and snow mold and uh, pythium and some of the uh, more severe uh, turf grass diseases. So, uh, you know, leave this to the golf course superintendent uh, you know, for your, using in their putting greens. Not a not a good grass for the home lawn. Uh, further, um, bent grass can become an aggressive problem. So sometimes people try to plant this in their lawns, and it becomes very patchy and ugly, and it smothers um, other grasses. Um, but then it scalps and it turns brown. Um, so not a good grass for a home lawn, and it can be a very um, difficult weed to, to uh, control when it gets into a uh, tall fescue or a Kentucky bluegrass or ryegrass lawns. Just want to say a word here about some terminology I've used, um, uh, blends and mixtures. So quite simply, mixtures are... Uh, two or more turf grass species combined and then seeded um, into a lawn or on a sod farm and then transplanted onto a lawn. So that would be like bluegrass ryegrass or bluegrass fescue. Um, those would be mixtures. Blends are two or more varieties of the same species uh, in combination. So so blends might be two different varieties or cultivars of Kazaki bluegrass that are combined uh, maybe for differing uh, uh, disease resistance or drought resistance, um, something like that, or shade tolerance. Um, so sod growers will often do this with bluegrasses. We'll put uh, three or four or five different varieties together. So you get this this blend of Kentucky bluegrass, a sod that is very adaptable, adaptable to many conditions uh, wherever the bluegrass might be planted. So the, the, the varieties that are a little more shade tolerant, if that sod gets planted in the shady lawn, they'll do better. The ones that are more sunny uh, or hot sun tolerant, they'll do better in the more full sun parts of the lawn. So, so this is a, 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 an explanation of the difference between blends and mixtures. And here's a table. Uh, you also have a hard copy of this that kind of summarizes all the different tolerances of these different grasses. Um, and kind of helps you decide where they might or might not do well in different uh, home landscape or parks or golf course situations. Okay, so that ends our discussion of cool season grasses. Be looking for the uh, other recording on the uh, warm season species, some of which might be very useful in uh, 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 Colorado for lawns and parks and golf courses and athletic turf. 
Uh, as always, you can send me an email or a text message if you have questions or send them to me in Canvas. Thanks for listening, folks.